Well, good afternoon and for some good morning, uh, everybody. Uh, welcome to this uh, this webinar on in unpacking interoperability. Uh, so um, my name's Keith Russell and um, I'm really interested in this discussion around what does inter interoperability mean in practice. Uh, so my name's Keith Russell, uh, Manager of Engagements at the Australian Research Data Commons. Uh, last year we started a, a series of work around FAIR and what does FAIR mean and uh, as we went through each of the topics interoperability definitely was one of the more complex um, uh, issues and uh, that was also out of the survey, survey we conducted. We also noticed that it was viewed by a lot of people as quite a complicated topic. So we thought we'd put a little bit of an extra effort into that, into unpacking what does it actually mean what does interoperability mean and what levels are there around interoperabilities and ways of thinking about that? And for that, we have two, uh, two guest speakers today. Uh, we have Bruce Simons and uh, we have Jonathan Yu. I'll, um, I'll present, uh, I'll introduce both of them in a second. So um, first of all, uh, um, I'll just provide a little bit of background, a little bit of context um, to kick it off. And then, uh, then I'll hand over first to Bruce. So first of all, um, just a bit of context around interoperability and uh, from the perspective of the FAIR data principles. So um, if you look at the FAIR data principles, um, the third, third letter, I, is around interoperability. And uh, there they've listed three principles um, around interoperability. And the first one is that metadata and data use a formal, accessible, shared and broadly applicable language for knowledge representation. So we've had a lot of questions. What does that really mean and what does that look like? And things you can think about and there are sort of using uh, controlled vocabularies, ontologies, etc. And also uh, using a sort of a common, a, a good data model. Yes. So well-defined framework to describe and structure data and metadata. And today we'll hear a bit, we hear quite a bit more about what that means in practice from, from Bruce, and, Bruce and Jonathan. Uh, another aspect to that second principle there is uh, that metadata and data use vocabularies that follow the FAIR principles so that the, met, the vocabularies themselves are also made FAIR, findable, accessible, interoperable, reusable. So that means that the vocabularies need to be documented and resolvable using a globally unique and persistent identifier. So you can point off to the vocabulary and know that you actually have the, the right version of the vocabulary. Um, and the last principle they have there is um, metadata and data uh, should include qualified references to other related pieces of metadata and data. So just having a reference off to another data set and saying uh, this data set is related to that data set, is, it's a starting point, but it's not a qualified reference. So actually having a bit more context around what does that relationship to that other data set or, or related metadata look like adds value. So uh, that it is part of or derived from or a subset of, uh, that actually is a much richer reference uh, between the two pieces of two elements. So one of the challenges in this space, if you look at interoperability, is, is having standards and using standards and uh, um, referring to those. So if you are looking for standards and, and uh, looking for places where you can find standards in specific disciplines or specific areas, one of the places you can go to is fairsharing.org. Um, it's a global um, sort of website portal that collects all sorts of standards, databases, policies, guidelines, etc. And I think for the discussion today, especially the pages around standards uh, are useful. It's got more than 1,200 standards in there at present, and you can actually add your own and deposit your own standard and add it to that list and point off to those the standard there. Uh, that's one place where you might be able to deposit your standards. There are other places too. And um, if you are looking at setting either using a vocabulary or setting up your own vocabulary, building one, uh, have a look at Research Vocabularies Australia. It's one of the places you could uh, you can use to either find vocabularies or set up your own vocabulary. So I hope that this is these are two two pieces two pieces of the puzzle that might be useful um, if you are working yourself on um, on making your data interoperable. So that was all the slides from me at this point. Um, so now I'd like to hand over to Bruce um, and just hear his perspective. So Bruce is a research associate at uh, Federation University's uh, CERDI, 
at the Center for E-Research and Digital Innovation. And Bruce has been involved with designing information management systems and research into data exchange mechanisms and interoperability, including the geology and groundwater open geospatial consortium data exchange standards. So the, sorry, the geology, that's the GeoSciML and the groundwater, groundwater ML, um, Open Geospatial Consortium, that most people just refer to as OGC, uh, OGC Data Exchange Standards. So, uh, Bruce, I'd like to hand over to you, and if you'd like to give us a bit of an overview of the work you've been doing there, that'd be great. Thanks very much, Keith. Uh, so, look, yeah, Keith's pretty much said everything I need to say. I, I, I don't think I need to say much here. It's been a wonderful introduction there. Um, what, I, what I'd like to do is just give a bit of background on, on why interoperability uh, what it means, and then perhaps some of the challenges for for uh, implementing it. So here's a, um, a slide from a long time ago, yeah, turn of the century stuff. There's there's lots of problems in um, you know, trying to standardise data across organisations, and look, there are very good reasons why we don't have standardised data across different organisations. Um, but at the end of the day, you know, this makes it difficult for the client, the, the user. And, and I guess what interoperability is about is about looking at, at your data from a user perspective. And, and that's a, 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 a change that most organisations perhaps don't think about. So one of the early challenges, well, you know, what we'll do is we'll just make everyone have a standard database. We'll just all have the same database and it'll be all, all um, everything will be, be hunky-dory. Well, back in the 90s, the uh, North Americans spent a lot of effort, you know, 10 years of, of, of coming up with a standard way of storing geological data. And it was mandated by the USGS that anyone would do it. So they implemented four of those uh, um, databases. Uh, Australia, we, 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 we took their model and, and implemented it as well. And by the end of those five different implementations, none of them could talk to each other. Basically, the variations that each organisation placed on top of that made it that the, the, there was no interoperability between the databases, no standardisation between the databases. So Simon Cox from CSIRO came along and said, look, you know, stop worrying about the persistence layer. Don't worry about your databases. Instead, establish an exchange protocol. And I guess that's sort of the start of, of the interoperability journey that, that um, certainly it was for me. There's different ways of, of, of your making data available. And, and, and this is um, a, from a, a paper that, that um, Paul Box and Co put together some time ago now. But yeah, traditionally what would happen, we'd have a whole lot of different data sources, uh, different databases, and, and the user would have to find all those databases, work out how to access the data, work out how to extract it, interpret it, um, all the other, the, uh, I just lost my, my page here. Uh, yeah, transform it. And all the effort is on the user side. An alternative is, is, is you have a centralised system where um, you know, a single data custodian makes their data available and, and users all extract their data from that single data source. It, it, you know, it, kind of think, well, this could work for something like, you know, the, the weather data, or everyone just gets it from the Bureau of Met. But even in practice, that tends not to be the case, that, that we've got um, other bureaus from other countries that you might want to get the data from. Um, there's now crowdsourcing weather data that you might want to get to. So even a centralised data system tends not to, not to, to, to um, be sustainable. Uh, another approach, and it's been common for, for some of the um, NCRIS facilities, is to have an intermediary. So we'll aggregate data from these various sources and make that available for um, all the users. That is, you know, this is a, a good system that the users only have to worry about going to the aggregator. It becomes a bit of a, a challenge for the, um, the business model for the aggregator. I mean, they're neither a provider of data, and, and so they're not a vested interest in maintaining that data, nor are they necessarily a user of the data. So there's kind of a, a, a business model challenge ahead with this particular model. A, a model that's been quite successful, particularly in the um, groundwater world in, in uh, Canada, was where the National Groundwater Organisation, the National Resources of Canada, said, well, well if, if each of the provinces puts together 
put, puts up a service, in this case they used a web feature service, but the technology doesn't really matter, then what we'll do is we'll access those services and then reformat it and put, put a community application schema over the top of that so that the users only have to access our um, services and they'll be able to access all these other um, provincial survey services. It uh, works fine if you've got a mandate to do that, um, but it still requires a, some kind of agreed schema to do it. And finally, there's, I guess, the, 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 the gold star and clearly therefore the most difficult is where each data provider puts up some kind of service according to a standard that is all agreed on. And, and then the end users, doesn't matter where they, they're getting their data from, are accessing it via the same mechanisms in the same format with the same content and, and ultimately that's that's sort of the interoperability gold star so what what the heck is interoperability well you know there's there's all sorts of different definitions for it around the place i'm into uh, i i quite happy, happy with, with leslie wyborn's uh mean when she says you know look it's, it's my stuff and when i sort of that stuff and talk about computers programs data etc all that other stuff operates with your stuff and i don't give a damn where it is how it works or what the format is um keith talked about fair and this is yeah i, I guess yeah we talked about interoperability in, in in the early days now fair is is um the, the guiding principle um, there's governments around the world are moving towards it. Uh, research funders require data to be published that way, and, and, and research journals, you know, what data to be made available. So it kind of adds this nice it, it words that we can understand that, that you know, the finding accessible and reusable to this horrible interoperable word. So, so what does it mean? Well, you know, the interoperable part of FAIR is that, uh, you know, the computer can interpret data so that it can be automated, uh, automatically combined with other data. As Keith's already said, you know, there's metadata and data used, community agreed vocabularies, there's links to related information, and that's all done through persistent identifiers. And the data is accessible via community agreed formats in community agreed languages and using community agreed vocabularies. So Keith's told us about that. But when we look at the other parts of FE, you know, the English, the bits we can understand, the findable, accessible, and reusable, we notice that. Actually, there's an awful lot of interoperability built into those, that we need globally unique and persistent identifiers. We need to have searchable resources. Um, they need to be, data and, and metadata needs to be retrieved by the identified identifiers using some standardized protocol. The protocols need to be universal. There needs to be machine readable license and provenance information and domain specific data and metadata standards. So these are all actually parts of interoperability. So what are interoperability requirements? Well, this is a, a slide from, from Eric and Gigan um, a long time ago. And they talked about database systems, but you can just think of them as, as data systems. Um, but, but, you know, what does it mean? Well, putting a, a bit more understanding into this, effectively they're saying, well, we need to have systems, agreed systems. Uh, we need to have an agreed syntax. We need to have agreed data structures, the schematics, and we need to have agreed data content for interoperability to occur. I would add an extra one on top of that and say we need organisational interoperability. We need a social commitment for data providers to make their data available uh, via standards for interoperability to occur. Um, Maybe think of interoperability in terms of a driving analogy. You know, there's two systems in the world. We either drive on the left or we drive on the right. But if we don't know where we go in the world, we actually recognise roads. And we recognise whether they're farm tracks or, or four-lane highways. And we can recognise vehicles, the things that, are, that, that drive on these roads. So that's kind of the systems that we have in common. In terms of vehicle operation, you know, the steering wheel may be on the other side, but, but fundamentally, you know, we get into a car anywhere in the world and, we, and it kind of makes sense. We, can, we know how to operate it. Um, you can imagine how difficult it would be if, for instance, the um, brake and accelerator pedals were the other way around. I mean, I mean it, there'd be a major barrier to interoperability of, of driving if that was the case. There may be some differences, like, you know, whether the, and, uh, the differences 
uh, more perhaps between vehicles within any of these systems rather than between the system so that you know the, the indicator or the, the uh, wiper uh, controls may be on different sides of the steering column but that's within each system not 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 um, between systems and that's kind of like in, in interoperability languages you know, like whether you're using XML or JSON in, in, in the syntax that they, it doesn't really matter when we, when we move a little bit further up, we see you know, that the road rules and the signs, the stop signs, the giveaway signs tend to be the same. We can go to these different parts of the world and, and, and it's kind of all, all, all makes sense. We've got some kind of, of standards happening there. Um, a little bit further up the chain, the driver behaviour might be slightly different, and that's going to be a bit more challenging. That you know, that, that to whether you, um, the, the French treatment of pedestrian crossings, or the Italian treatment of, of speed limits, or the Indian use of of, of headlights. You know, th these are kind of local changes that that if you're a, a stranger coming into it, you, you find it maybe find it quite difficult to understand. But but ultimately, for interoperability to occur, it's that final organisational requirement that basically you're we're dependent that every driver wants to get from point A to point B safely, and and, and they will drive according to those standards. Um, what one, one of the, the issues with interoperability is as we move up this chain, it becomes more and more difficult. It becomes more and more social. Um, the, the technical aspects at the bottom are, are, are far easier to, to deal with. So just looking at some of those, working way up that chain, you know, the, the, the system interoperability. So that's, uh, Leslie would say we, that's, that we are connected via standard protocols. Um, it, it's all about the, you know, that, that wonderful IT world that, that there's appropriate operating systems, whether they're, they're Microsoft or Apple or Android or whatever, that we have established network protocols, the HTTPs and, and HTTPSs of the world. We have web services, whether they're REST, whether they're web feature services, whether they're JSON. And I should say, look, in this particular world, there's lots and lots of acronyms. I could explain these acronyms and they wouldn't make any, any more sense to, to, to expand on them. Um, I guess they're just there so that if you actually do recognise any of the acronym, it kind of puts it into a context for you. And, and we need appropriate governance of all these systems. So whether it's the, the, the web consortium or the open geospatial consortium or ISO or whatever, that, that these systems are, are, are governed appropriately and we can rely, therefore rely on them. Moving up the chain, uh, there's syntactic interoperability. So the data languages. Leslie, my machine talks the same gibberish as yours. Um, this, it, so, so it's about the packaging and transmission mechanisms. So whether the languages are XML, GML, JSON, whether the formats are shapefiles or GeoJSON or NetCDF, what the resource identifiers, whether there's the HTTP URIs or or URLs, as some people would call them, URNs, DOIs, handles, whatever. Again, important, there's appropriate, whatever it is, whichever one of these ones we're using, there's appropriate governance for it. So these systems in syntax interoperability, we can kind of think as foundational. They are the, the building blocks that we need for the data exchange between systems. However, they aren't sufficient. They don't tell us how the receiving system can interpret the data without further, in the past, mostly human intervention. So the schematic interoperability, and this is the area, I guess, that, that I've mostly been involved in. This is where the MLs come in. Um, it's in the early term, basically, we're agreeing on what, what the attribute names and types are for the kind of data. In the past, we would have taken some kind of conceptual model. Um, this has been done in UML, but you do it on whiteboards, doesn't matter how it's done. Uh, move it across to some logical, physical model. Um, in, in database talk, that's kind of a, 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 an ER diagram, if you like, or you know, it's a structure of how you're structuring your data. And then in the final one here, we've actually moved it across to what's called a physical model. This is a, a real world implementation of, of something a machine can understand. So it's obviously in horrible XML machine language. So one of the issues with, with the schema, though, is, is, is a question that the community has to, 
think about how widely understood they want their data to be. So we can easily exchange data with communities. We, we've been doing a lot of time. And where the community understands what we're talking about, we could just send a CSV file, for instance. We can say, you know, here's a, here's a column called temp, and here's a few numbers, and, and here's some more numbers. And it all makes sense to someone, we hope. Once we want it to be used in a wider communities, we need more precise definitions to, to explain the complexities of the real world. So here, that previous example, now we're saying, well, the observed property is temperature. And importantly, we've said not even that it's just temperature, but we've gone to here's a a, a link to a, a, a meaning for temperature. Um, so that's the content. I'll talk about that a bit later on. The feature of interest is a, is a platypus. Uh, the procedure is some thermometer process. The time, and here we've got it in, in um, an ISO time format. Here's a result where the minimum value is this and the unit of measure is this and the maximum value. So here we've provided far more information. And so agreement at an international level enables data to be used by other domains. So I don't need to know anything about um, platypuses to, to be able to, to read what this, this information is. I can use it straight away. And the other thing is what is important is, is, is to be able to reuse established patterns from other domains rather than, than coming up with your, with your own particular set of patterns that's specific for your domain that then can't be used by your others. And so the majority of, of particularly science-based um, work largely is about observation so that a pattern of observation and measurements can be reused. So now you can probably, yeah, we, 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 this, is, this is the one that, that we often get uh, struggle over. So in Ezri's term, yeah, this is where my concept of lake is exactly the same as your concept of water body. And not only that, here's a, um, if you went and resolved this URI, it would tell you more about lake, water body, those kinds of things. So rather than the English term lake or the English term water body, if we use this URI, it provides that semantic interoperability. It tells us the data content. So computer systems can, can exchange that data unambiguously. Um, there's a question of what kind of control of vocabularies are required. Is a, is a simple term list sufficient? Do we want an authority file, taxonomies, thesaurus, or, or a full-blown ontology. So, so it becomes more and more difficult as we move up that chain to, to establish those things. What's the knowledge representation we're going to use? And what's, is it SCOS? Is it Dublin Core? I'm just going to use codes. Uh, again, languages fall into this. Do we, that's computer languages. Do we use RDF, you know, XML, OWL? How are we going to represent the, this? Um, you know, Keith mentioned the research vocabularies Australia. That's one one way of, of accessing these vocabularies. There's CIRO have a linked data registry. Um, there's SysVoc as a, as a tool that, that enables enables you to access vocabulary services. But, I, but to me, that the big challenge in the semantic world is is the governance aspect. Um, you know, units of measure is, is a classic example that, that this is crucial to, to all, all our observations, to everything we're doing. And yet, the, the governance of units of measure ontologies is, is appalling. You know, there, there's, there's so many out there. There's the UCUM and QUDT, uh, uh, both NASA ones, there's, there's others. There's RVA has a unit of measure that's governed by Geoscience Australia. So none of these are complete. Um, that some of them have got not very transparent governance processes. Uh, how do you, you know, how do you add to it? How do you how do you manage it? So, so to me, there's a, there's a real challenge in this this governance and and of, uh, and setting up of of, of um, vocabularies. The, the domain specific ones tend to be pretty good. You know, the AgriVoc one run by the the FAO. Um, the, the Kebby, the chemistry entities for biological investigation, I think um, the CGI, GSIML, geology ones, and, and you know, um, Sire, I've got a, a WestML. So when we get to the domain ones, it's not so bad, but, but uh, cross domain particularly are, are, are particularly challenging. And, and I think governance is a, is a real challenge for the semantic interoperability. 
finally, up the organisation job with him. And they, uh, Leslie says, look, this says I will share my services, i.e. I'll share my data with you. And it covers, you know, the policy, the social, the organisation. And, and, and this is really difficult. I mean, what's the value propositions? What's the, what are the benefits and costs? And, and we talked about that a little earlier on with, with, with from a research point of view where um, journals are, are requesting data to be provided made available through FAIR. Uh, we've got governments who are sort of adopting an open policies and that sort of says that well, you need to start looking at, at how users are going to access your data. Um, but what about private data? I mean, that, that's a real challenge to, to be getting getting a, a lot of uh, private data available and, and moving into the agricultural field. This is this is a particular big challenge. Um, is there also with funding? I mean, how do you, who, who, how do we, 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 we convince organisations to, to, to put the resources into it? Establishing agreements. What are, what's the roles and responsibilities, and, and you know, the stewardship of, of the whole um, community? And and finally, what are the risks and responsibilities of, of participating in any community that that agrees on on interoperability? So yeah, I guess overall, the interoperability requirements are fundamentally a desire to participate. Having decided you will participate, then a commitment to use whatever the community agreed standards are. They need to cover common data content. They need to cover common data structure. Uh, there needs to be availability of appropriate technologies, and, and that's mostly the case now. And we don't want to be locking organisations into, into particular types of software or, or software vendors. That's not sustainable into the future. So I guess some of the challenges, and you know, there's lots and lots of challenges. There's the organisation drivers I see is a real, a real big one. You know, we've been doing this for a long time, and it's really, really challenging to get organisations to change their their behaviour, to look at things from from a user data point of view. Um, having done that, you know, what are the alignment processes and policies within organisations and across organisations? Security is becoming more and more of an issue. One of the services that I've dealt with, of course, are all open. Um, that presents problems for, for access to the services and potential service attacks. Um, I think fundamentally the governance of standards and online resources, they're required at all levels of interoperability, but, but the vocabularies are, are particularly fraught. A lot of data standards are, are immature. There's challenges in terms of, of different modelling practices. The standards are complex, but you know, science domains are really complex domains, and that leads to standards that are both difficult to develop and, from a developer's point of view, really difficult to implement. So we keep getting this pushback against standards to try and simplify things. Um, standards keep changing. Uh, you know, persistent URIs is a good example that, that when I started, URNs were all the go, then, then you know, HTTP URIs become URLs, and, and then maybe DOIs and handles. Um, and, and XML and JSON you know, is a good example that XML is really good because we can have an XML schema and that can check to see that what you're delivering validates, whereas JSON's nice and simple, so JSON's developers like that. But of course now JSON are going, well, actually that's a bit too flexible. Maybe we need a, a JSON schema to be able to check to see if the JSON validates. Um, we're cutting edge of some of these solutions. Um, WFS3, I haven't played around with that. That's coming out. Finding and linking services. So if I've got content which is coming from different different services, how do I embed that if I've got a, a, a web service which requires one kind of format and now I'm getting a vocabulary service coming into there which is a different format? How do we, how do we link all those together? How do I run filter queries across some of these things? And and we've talked about these protocols, and I can say, look, it's going to be a, a, a GSIML protocol that's going to be in GML and it's going to be in XML. But if I want a Australian version of GSIML, how do I profile that? How do I, how do I know which particular profile that these protocols are coming in? Um, and and you know, finally, the, the software, the, there's lots of challenges in, in, in developing software that's usable and, and does what we want it to do both open source and proprietary, there's challenges there. But probably the, the, the biggest challenge is, is our human skill capabilities. You know, when we think about what we're trying to do here, we're, we're moving from 
right down in the, the grassroots, right down in the, in, in the weeds of, of, of IT world, down in the systems, right up into the domain specific areas of vocabularies, up into organisational management areas. And, and, you know, who has the skills to be able to um, move up and down that, that whole, whole range of, of, of domains? So that's it from me. Uh, I'll hand back to you, Keith. Thank, thank you very much, Bruce. That was really interesting and a broad overview of, of, of the different layers of interoperability and also the challenges in this in this space. So, um, Jonathan, um, Jonathan is, is, is a data scientist uh, with the Envir Environmental Informatics Group at CSIRO and uh, his particular expertise in information and web architectures, data integration, data analytics and visualization. He currently leads a number of initiatives to develop new approaches and tools for connecting information flows across the environmental domain and the broader uh, digital economy within Australia and internationally. That includes the uh, CSIRO Knowledge Network, which is enabling greater discovery and use of uh, government, scientific, academic and spatial data. So um, without further ado, I'd like to hand over to uh, to Jonathan to talk about uh, WESC, I think you pronounce it, the Water and Energy Supply and Consumption Data Standard and what the, the mm. steps you needed in developing that. Okay, thanks for that. Um, so I'll just be talking um, about a domain specific example. I think Bruce gave a really good overview of um, interoperability and some of the issues there. I'll be diving into specific details about um, a data standard that we've been developing uh, that Bruce was also involved in uh, at CSIRO around um, enabling interoperability for water energy supply and consumption um, uh, research data. So this, this project um, was commissioned by the Oran, um, uh, Oran project. So Oran is the Australian Urban Research um, Infrastructure Network. Um, and at that time, they had a challenge around um, gathering research data for the water energy supply and consumption, particularly in, um, in cities and uh, regional areas. Um, and the context of that is that um, this sort of data is um, scattered across um, different organizations, uh, utilities, um, ABS, um, energy companies, and each of them have maintained their own databases around this sort of data. So just to give you an example, um, I've got some here. So this is data that um, when you request data from these organizations, you'll get something like this. So this is water consumption data. They'll tell you the quarter, uh, the billing quarter, the locality or LGA, um, what kind of you know, aggregated premises there were, how many sites and um, you know, kiloliters of built usage. Um, so this is just from one provider. If you ask another provider, they'll give you this format, which is LGA and then the different quarters and then some number, which is fine. You just have to ask them what the numbers mean. And in this case, uh, I think these are uh, kiloliters. Um, and then you go and ask another pro provider and they'll give you this sort of format. So um, instead of having uh, uh, one set of columns, you have multiple set of columns going across the sheet um, and so on and so forth. So um, the challenge is, while the data is all there, how do you actually interpret this in a sensible way? And how do you actually um, uh, do some research over it? Um, so uh, what the team did was, um, given this challenge, we defined a information model. So I'm just walking you through the WestML site, which documents all of this. Um, and we've tried to make this um, as clear as possible on the website. So if you've got any feedback around um, or any I, I, things that you don't understand, please give us feedback. Um, but what we did in the first instance is to start to conceptualize what um, water and energy supply and consumption data should be represented as in a common format um, and therefore develop this information model um, through different um, classes of things. So this is just showing the aggregated consumption and the different um, properties for it. Um, then we can also drill down into specific consumption, 
uh, and look at meter readings uh, for water, gas, and electricity, um, and then look at supply side things. So this is a information model for um, water energy supply. So you can get um, represent things that are common across supply data, as well as specific for electricity, water, and um, even down to the specific zone substation electricity supply. Um, and that's just a common model and there's a more uh, detailed model. Uh, but basically this allows us to represent things in a common format, a common representation, common semantics. So all those levels that Bruce mentioned around syntax, schema and semantics. Um, and then we can then start to define the semantics of different definitions. So here we've got um, a section describing um, the vocabularies. Um, they're maintained at our linked data registry here. So if you get, it's linked off to this site. So these are all the resources defining um, the commodities, uh, the energy types, the land use types. Um, let's drill down to one specific one around uh, electricity consumption. And so you've got a definition and then you can have, you know, narrow consumption uh, descriptions and get into more detail. And typically this is where the researcher will come in to help define that and we'll encode that in this vocabulary. Um, uh, we've also got ways to visualize this so they can be more easily accessible by people and understand the hierarchy of things. Um, so using SCOS as the common representation here, we can define um, all the different representations and nest them um, and visualize them for quick access. Um, uh, so in this particular project, what we wanted to do was standardize the language, which this page represents, but also standardize some tooling so we can do some rapid deployment of data infrastructure. So if we have a common um, representation of the data, uh, we can build common data services, um, leveraging that representation, and then deliver that out um, via web services to researchers, um, third-party applications, um, and in this case, um, we've partnered with the Oran platform. So our data sets that we've harmonized can be accessed via Oran. Um, this is their data catalog showing if you search for WESC, um, you get nine data sets and these are all different uh, providers providing water energy consumption. Um, and then in the portal, what you can do is pull them in, you can get the tabular representation um, and you can see here that they've been, um, this is for Yarra Valley Water, and it's been um, harmonized according to the different fields that we've defined in our information model. Um, so there's no ambiguity around, you know, uh, what specific numbers mean. Um, we even give URIs for the property types and the units, I believe. Yep, units, yeah. Um, so, yeah, you can get the definition of of those uh, units from, from the data itself. It's linked to external vocabularies. Um, and then in this, in this portal, we can start to visualize that. So pull in the data and do some um, quarter per um, map visualizations. So we can pull in the Yarra Valley water um, by localities, as well as the city west water and start to see if there are any patterns of consumption um, that you can see here. Um, we've also been working with another project called NIA. Um, so NIA, if I go just to this website, um, the NIA program is the National Energy Analytics Research Program that, um, that Sarah is working with the Department of um, uh, Energy and Environment, en Environment and Energy uh, Commonwealth um, Agency, um, and that's also trying to do the same thing that um, we just. We, we did in the RM project, which was to aggregate um, data from across different organizations. Um, and in this particular case, WESC is being applied to zone substation data. And so again, multiple utilities represent their zone substation data in multiple different formats. Um, and there's been a lot of work in cleaning that up and providing uh, fine grained uh, zone substation data using the WESC ML format. Um, so, so you can go here and basically download um, the Ausgrid zone substation load data. 
um, and be confident that um, the fields are um, described and you can compare that um, data set with other utilities. So, you know, for example, Osgrid with Energex um, and do that 30 minute you know, load data comparison. Um, so uh, I guess um, that's really in a nutshell, the WESC ML format and how it's being used and applied um, in these two different projects, uh, both in Oran and NIA. Um, and it's really an example of how we can gain interoperability by applying the syntactic um, interoperability up to the semantic. Um, some of the challenges around this is more on the social side of things. So while we have these technologies and um, formalisms for describing the data, um, the challenge is actually getting adoption, I guess, uh, down at the supply side, at the data provider side, um, in adopting these sort of standards to deliver the data out in these ways and this, these representations. Currently, the drivers for this particular data standard come from the, um, the consumption side, so as in the researcher side, so researchers or policy analysts who want to do um, the of analysis at you know this scale where you want to drill down into a locality, a suburb or a postcode or a SA2. Um, you need the data in a good, easy way to do your analysis and visualize, for example. Um, however, for the data providers, there's really you know little incentive for them to provide that out in, in a way that you know can be accessed in this manner. So projects such as Oren um, and NIA are really catalysts for those um, transformations to happen, the, the interoperability work. But I guess the challenge is how do we get that in a more sustainable way where that sort of interoperability is shared across uh, different actors. Um, the other challenge is also on this side around the vocabularies, which I started discussing. So here where we have um, different terms and different definitions of things. Each one of these terms and definitions needs to be curated by somebody um, or a community. So as Bruce mentioned, you know, scaling up that the human skill levels that can understand how to formalize these vocabularies in a way that's uh, discrete, but also linked to different definitions and external other vocabularies um, but still be scientifically accurate and applicable in this in, in for research data like this um, is is quite a you know a skill to be able to cultivate. So you know how can we scale that um, across different communities? Um, but once we do have those vocabularies, I think you know you, we can we can basically reuse them over and over again. So getting good quality vocabularies um, in the first place is a challenge, but once we do have them, you know that helps the interoperability story across different projects and, and research. Um, so I'll just conclude there. Um, this was really an applied um, presentation on how we use uh, information modeling, vocabularies, data transformations um, in this domain of water energy supply and consumption. Thanks, Jonathan. Sorry, there we are. Um, so, uh, Thank you very much. That was a really interesting, especially as a use case, to see what it looks like in practice and how you can work on interoperability in practice. I think it was very interesting to hear these different perspectives and the different angles required around making data interoperable. And um, one of the one of the things that sort of came to mind looking at these presentations and looking at the the, the way you're tackling this and addressing it is with all the data that's out there around. Australia or maybe even more even globally is it is it actually feasible to make data everywhere interoperable is it actually uh, possible is that something we should aim for what is the scope you should aim for when you are thinking about making your data interoperable do you have Bruce and Jonathan do you have any thoughts on how far can we realistically go Okay. Can you hear me, Keith? Yes. Yes, I can hear you now. Thanks. <laughs> um, 
Yeah, a, a good question. I mean, the, the the example of the databases from from North America was, you know, we can't have one system that, that everyone uses. It's just it's just not possible. So to me, it's about minimising the barriers to, to interoperability. Um, that that you know, if if every if you look at the the um, railway gauge issues, you know, I can say. Yes, we can overcome the fact that we've got different gauge railway tracks in Australia, but it requires um, having dual gauge tracks. It requires having bogey exchange systems. It requires getting people to change trains and different platforms. So, so we can get around that. But obviously, if we can minimise that, then that makes it better. So, so it's about communities going. What are the what are the ways that we can minimise those barriers? What's to users using our data? Um, now, some communities will. Will go down a, a perhaps a quite a rigorous path, and others might say, and, and that'll depend on kind of the, the level of governance, I guess, of that particular community and, and the importance to be able to exchange data. Uh, others might have a more flexible, and, and I, and I, you know, I, I you've got to enter somewhere, and, and I would imagine that that sort of a, a early, uh, not so interoperable, but, but at least. You know, some level of interoperability, and then gradually over time, it would move towards a, a, a you know, gold star kind of interoperability. It's kind of a, a maturity index of of, mature, of interoperability, if you like. Jonathan. Yeah, um, it's it's. I don't know if we can gain hundred percent interoperability across all communities, but yeah, as Bruce mentioned, lowering the barriers. Um, providing tools where people can more easily share their data in, in standardized ways. Um, and to a certain extent, it's, it also is, or to a large extent, it's a social contract with multiple communities, isn't it? Like um, people come together to agree that we're going to exchange data in this way for these purposes. So um, getting that agreement <laughs> Uh, that social commitment in the first place will pave the way for that sort of interoperability. You're muted, Keith. Sorry, thanks. <laughs> thanks Chris. Uh, so, is it is it actually working from that organisational interoperability down to to sort of well, maybe not down, but at least making sure that the organisations have an agreement around a shared goal that you're working towards? Yeah, and, and it, 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 the organisations have to have a, 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 a be on board. Um, how you get organisations on board is, is quite challenging. Um, that in you know, North America, it was tended to be a, a carrot that they said, well, we'll pay for each organisation to, to be involved in, in, in this. Uh, in Europe, with the Inspire program, it was kind of a legislative approach that every country will deliver their data according to these standards, and you know we'll use a big stick to to uh, make you do it. Both of those mechanisms have problems. Uh, the 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 Canadian example where they you know basically made it easy for each province to put up their data via whatever services they had, and then federally pulled them together was kind of uh, meant that each of the, the data providers could see advantages for them in, in that their data was made available along with everyone else's, uh, but it wasn't a, wasn't a huge barrier for them. So there's kind of you know, each each community has to look at, at, at ways to do that. Um, you know, the, the, the AR, I guess to me it's it's kind of like the ARDC saying, well, from a research point of view, these are the benefits that a particular community could have by making their data available. So, what can we do to 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 assist that? And and making, you know, so research vocabularies Australia saying, look, here's a place that that people can put their vocabularies up quite easily, uh, make them available. That that kind of makes it is a low barrier to to the to the semantic interoperability. Um, if we sort of go well. There's two groups in Australia that have got the same kind of data. If we get them together and say, well, what's a, what's a common structure for your data that, that you're happy with? It may not be internationally standard, but it's a, you know, it works well between you two, and that can kind of help get over that bit. And, and so I was trying to get over those little bits, um, but 
but it usually requires some some other external driver, whether it's the ARDC mm. or the federal governments or, or whatever. Yeah, I think I think getting buy-in from different um, stakeholders and organisations is key, um, and having the infrastructure to support that collaboration is also a key thing. So, if you come together and say we're all going to do, you know, in, have a standard for you know this sort of data, but don't have any way of sharing, don't have any infrastructure, don't have any services, don't have any. Um, formalisms for describing the vocabularies, then that's going to fall over. So I think it's both the social and the technical coming together as well. And, and, and you know, part of the challenge of is, is the persistence of these things. The users expect to be able to, if, if they're building applications to access data from, from various data providers, then they don't want them falling over or changing on a, on a, on a regular basis. So we've got this kind of tension between we want it to be easy for data providers to make their data available, but we need it to be standardised, which means it's not going to be easy to make it available. And, and, and how we find a sweet spot there that uh, that allows persistence through standardisation, but doesn't put big barriers in to, to people joining the community. Mm. And I guess there, there's also challenges if you're talking about using vocabularies or standards, um, the longevity or sustain sustenance or keeping them going, sustaining those standards and sustaining those vocabularies. Yeah, Jonathan. <laughs> <laughs> Jonathan. <laughs> uh, I, I mean, the work you've done so far. If there's maybe already things there that you you are you've seen or. Or possible solutions in that regard too. Yeah, well, the more so standards don't really exist independently of people using the standards. So the more people that use the standards, the more, I guess, risk management that you manage the risk of it being, you know, dying off, right? So um, having them having standards that are well defined, well scoped, and easy to use um, across um, jurisdictions across organizations globally, you know, like the OGC and W3C um, are good you know, organizations where you do have um, processes for standards adopt, adoption and defining. Um, you know, having them there, having those organizations take care of the publishing and maintenance of those standards, um, you know, takes it away from a project, takes it away from any um, individual actor to maintain that standard. I think we had an instance where um, an important vocabulary was um, locked up um, in the earth sciences because, you know, unfortunately, somebody passed away, and that was the um, that person was the sole maintainer maintainer of a vocabulary. Um, so, you know, the sweet the sweet um, vocabularies. Um, so that's that's a risk in and of itself. So having processes and organizations um, and users um, provides that longevity, I think. Yes, the sustainability of, of vocabularies is, is, I think, a, a real challenge. Um, because we're up in the, in the domain specific area here, largely, that, that so, so individual scientists say this is a vocabulary that I require so I will publish this one um, and, and so we start to get a proliferation of, of overlapping vocabularies without any real connection between them because that requires extra work to try and build those 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 inter interconnections and then you know, unless the organize there's organizations that are prepared to take on board the, the ongoing governance of those those particular vocabularies so, if I'm going to build a system, I don't want it to be dependent on on you know one person maintaining maintaining a vocabulary. I, I want it to be a, a persistent, sustainable, and well managed vocabulary. And, and and how do I judge that? How do I know? Apart from as Jonathan says, you know maybe by use. If, if everyone's using it, then maybe it'll persist. Mm. Yeah, or I if it has a, a yeah. Let's go on, Jonathan. Oh, sorry, so I was going to say or. Um, yeah, not just users using it, but also having the backing of 
um, you know, organizations, um, you know, OGC um, and other, you know, maybe government agencies as well. Yeah, it's actually, I, I asked that question to fair sharing. Uh, um, I said, well, can anybody just put their standard into fair sharing? Because uh, that would just mean it becomes a big bucket, all sorts of standards <laughs> with no clarity on how, how useful that standard actually is. And they said, yes, anybody in theory can deposit their standard, but it only becomes more interesting when you see that that standard is actually being used in policies or in databases or in other approaches or supported by organizations. So if you look at the way fair sharing set up you can actually see that this is a standard that doesn't have any ties or this is a standard that's actually already been adopted by these organizations is referenced in these policies and is in implemented in these databases for example so I thought that was an interesting way of, of providing a bit more depth on top of what just the standard itself yeah so um, just a question for, for both of you really for, for the from the perspective of the people on the call and that if you if a researcher comes up to you and says, I want to make my data interoperable, where do you start? Because you've presented a whole array of considerations and array of uh, perspectives and things you probably need to tackle down the track to fully make it interoperable. But if somebody's right at the start of that journey and thinking I should make my data interoperable, what would be a good starting point or a good few first steps to, to move them along that that, that point? So, so from my perspective, I'd be working down the, the interoperability arrow from from the top. You know, does the organisation that you represent want to make your data available? Have, have you got a commitment for some resourcing to actually make this happen? Um, so, and then that comes kind of questions about this data that you want to make available, is it actually your data? Do you have the authority to, 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 to make this, this data available? Uh, and then... Are there other, in, in your domain, in, in your community, are there other practitioners with similar data making theirs available? So, so you know, if so, use theirs, you know. <laughs> don't, don't invent things yourself, reuse stuff. Uh, if, if there isn't, but there are other practitioners there, what's their feeling? Do, you know, there's, there's no point having one telephone. We need two. So, so you know, can, can you both um, work together? together towards, toward something that you can agree on if there isn't one already out there. Um, and then, you know, your final ask because, okay, yeah, we're doing this, this is the way, these are the standards that are available, or we're going to develop our own standards to do this. Uh, what technology do you need to implement? Your organisation will have certain rules and, and practices about the way IT works in their, in their organisation. So how are you going to... Um, meld what you want to achieve with what the, what, what your organisation uh, wants to achieve, um, and that sort of goes back right back to the first question again. Okay, does the organisation really want to be a an interoperable interoperational organisation? <laughs> mm. Okay, thanks. Yeah. Yep, Jonathan. Yeah. Uh, yeah, just echo um, Bruce's uh, comments around don't reinvent the wheel if you don't have to. Um, and just look at what others are doing. Um, there's a lot of resources available, um, you know, in the vocabulary space um, and in this standards, the schema space, um, both OGC, W3C, um, and others are, are formalizing standards in those spaces. So you'd want to be checking them out before determining that you want a new standard. Um, but there's also lots of, you know, experience with people developing standards. So, you know, there's, there's probably worthwhile talking to people who, who have done it before as well. Just, I just say, so, yeah, in terms of the reuse there, I, we all kind of think of our domains as being very special and, and, and unique, therefore we need our own standard. But if you think about what a lot of, particularly science, but, but other domains as well, it's about making observations, you know, in a broader sense of observations, that an interpretation is an observation as well. So if you take a generic pattern and, and observations and measurements is a, is a, is a pattern, is an ISO standard, it's an OGC standard that um, Simon Cox was, was uh, the main author of, you'll find that you can take that pattern and apply it to your domain. And it doesn't matter whether it's vegetation, it doesn't matter whether it's marine. You know, we're basically, we're, we're observing things 
at certain times by certain people using certain procedures and we get a result. And, and that pattern can be reused uh, and, it, and it just makes it so much easier to say, okay, well, I don't have to worry about, you know, learning how to model things. What I need to do is learn, learn how to have vocabularies for my procedures and vocabularies for my results and, and, and those kind of things. Mm. Okay. Sorry, I just realised that I, I was looking in the wrong place for the questions and I found the questions now, uh, but I'm also aware that we're actually already running over time. Um, I think uh, there's a series of questions there, some of them around, are the slides available? Yes, the slides will be available, so that would be great. This has also been recorded so uh, people can watch it back and for those that weren't able to attend, please pass it on. Um, I think one question here that's probably worth having uh, very briefly tackling, I think it's an interesting perspective, as question is around, is there a role for funders here to require standardized data, standardized data in funded projects? Uh, so applicants can be asked to justify the standards and instruments they use. I thought it's an interesting angle. I don't know, Bruce, Jonathan, do you have any perspectives on that? Uh, it, it's... it's it, it's tricky that um, the, the, we can lock things down too tightly and then that becomes a, a barrier. Uh, I guess in terms of, you know, publications saying, look, data needs to be made available is kind of a, a, a financial sort of a process of, of saying, yeah, make your data interoperable. Um, I think it's certainly government organisations need to be be looking at that. It's their role to manage their data, and, and, and I think part of the whole managing and, and curating your data is about making it available and, and interoperable. Uh, it, 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 it's a, it's a, it is tricky to, to work out what that, that balance is between, um, I guess, forcing, <laughs> using a financial driver to, to, to make data available. Okay. Jonathan? Mm. Um, I, I mean, we, I, Bruce and I work in the earth and environmental sciences space, but looking to the other domains like the biomedical and the, um, the biosciences, um, they've had a long tradition of main, you know, mandating that the data needs to be in a certain format. And the advantages of that is then it makes them interoperable across different projects and research programs. Um, so th I think there are merits of um, mandating either through funders or journals that you know certain data sets be published using certain existing data standards if that's a, you know if, if it provides those advantages. Yeah, okay. I, I guess if, if, if you know, there are advantages, but but you know if the standard's not there, <laughs> then, then who's going to fund that standard if you mandate it? Yeah. Sure. Okay. Uh, well, well, thank you, thank you, Bruce, thank you, Jonathan, for your time. It's been really interesting to unpack unpack a little bit what does interoperability mean in practice, and I think especially those perspectives around the organisation and the commitment behind it. Uh, I think are, are really interesting questions and uh, things that are certainly of interest to, um, to well to the community out there and also to, to us at the research research data commons when thinking about if you want to bring data together into one virtual commons, how can you actually do that in an interoperable fashion and what does that mean and what are the aspects you need to consider for that. So thank you again very much for your time and um, uh, looking forward to uh, ongoing conversations and developing this thinking further around interoperability. Thank Thanks Keith. Thank you Keith. Thank you.